Hello there, how's your week been? I hope it's been a good one for you. I had a bit of a, an exciting week really, in fact, first time ever for me, I cut my own hair. What do you think? I was quite chuffed actually, a pair of nail scissors. I followed the line that Jo, my lovely hairstylist, <laughs> created for me when she cut it way back on the 6th of March and uh, it'll have to make do until everything sorts itself out and hopefully the salons will be open again at the beginning of July. But thank you so much for all the feedback on last week's story by Jojo Moyes, that was Crocodile Shoes. I thought it might be a popular choice. And also for the lovely things that you've said about the children's story that my daughter Lucy put together. Uh, me reading it and her slotting in all those lovely illustrations from that really beautiful book called The Invisible String. So uh, I think because it's been such a popular choice that uh, she and I might actually do another one together uh, in the not too distant future. But our story for today comes from this lovely collection by the Irish author Maeve Binchy. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but her first novel, Light a Penny Candle, was published in 1982. She went on to write 20 more novels. All of them were bestsellers. But this is a really beautiful collection called A Few of the Girls. And uh, it's the stories that she wrote that were published in magazines and in the Irish Times before she ever wrote a book. So uh, I think they were published after her death in 2012. But I very much hope that you'll enjoy the one I've chosen for you today, which is called Sandra's Suitcase. So if you're sitting comfortably, I shall put my spectacles on and away we go. Everyone said that Sandra was mad. All those countries in such a few days, overnight stops in cities that she would never remember. What a way to see Europe. But Sandra did not agree. All her life she had spent money on clothes and shoes. She had spent nothing on seeing foreign places. She didn't know what Paris looked like, or Brussels, or Venice, Florence, or Rome. She wouldn't waste her two weeks holiday just in one place. After all, clothes were so expensive and so essential that she might never be able to afford to travel again. Sandra knew you had to dress well to make a statement in life. So that's what she did made expensive statement after statement with everything she bought. She had read so many articles about how your clothes were a key to your character that she really believed it. Now, at the age of 27, she wondered why on earth these messages that she was sending out hadn't borne more fruit. Beautifully dressed, perfectly groomed, she sat in a dead-end job day after day and her private life contained no husband, partner or even long-term relationship. But it would all change eventually. Sandra knew it would. After all, she was playing life by the rules. Perhaps people might think she was dull because she hadn't travelled anywhere. After all, that silly girl in accounts who looked as if she'd fallen out of a garden hedge, she'd been to Russia. She even went for weekends to Brittany. And the girl in marketing, who wore the same dreary suit with a collection of different coloured T-shirts for years, had been to Australia and had come home via Fiji. Unfair as it was, people did seem to think they were more interesting to talk to than Sandra, who spent every waking moment reading fashion magazines and then scouring the stores to buy the latest recommendation. So now she was going on this coach tour. They were confined to one suitcase each, and Sandra spent six happy weeks wondering what to wear when being photographed outside the Louvre or in a gondola. She packed them all, as the fashion articles had instructed, with layers of tissue so they would not crush. But she put in a travel iron just in case. She chose a simple, washable dress to travel in, and she met all her fellow holiday makers at the coach depot. They seemed a nice enough crowd, nobody very stylish, and some of the women looking positively frumpish. Sandra shuddered. How could they bear to travel like that? Hardly any makeup, jeans, anoraks, comfortable certainly, but more suitable for doing the garden than for continental travel. And oddly, a lot of them seemed to be married or travelling with partners. Extraordinary what some men would put up with. Sandra sniffed disapprovingly. Their guide was a very fat man called Johnny. Johnny had a voice like a foghorn and a series of non-stop jokes. But he also managed to give them quite a lot of information. There were 30 people on the bus and Johnny had learned all their names before they got to Belgium. The coach whizzed them to the ferry, over the channel, and then, for the first time, Sandra's eyes saw a land that wasn't her own. People drove on the wrong side of the road. 
but she'd expected that. And they had shutters outside their houses, and a lot of people on bicycles. The traffic had been slower than the driver expected. When they got to Brussels, it was beginning to get dark. Now, you're all to go into your own rooms, open your suitcases, have the quickest shower ever known to humans, be back on the bus in 15 minutes. I'll then take you to the Grand Place and I will show you the sights and we'll have our dinner. Johnny's good humour was catching. The group was already looking forward to the night out. They all pulled their suitcases from the row of bags waiting outside the hotel. All except Sandra. Her bag wasn't there. She knew it had to be at the back of the bus somewhere, so she waited and waited. And then Johnny told her what she could not accept. Her bag was in London. But when will they send it? Will it be here tomorrow morning? Sandra was white with anxiety. They can't find it, Johnny said glumly. There'll be compensation, of course, but I'm very sorry. He was unprepared for the sense of tragedy in Sandra's face. My life is over, she said simply. My first and only trip abroad. I brought everything to be photographed in so that I would always remember it. And now your company has lost everything I love. Oh, nonsense, Sandra, you'll go abroad lots. And if you can't find it, then you'll get the money to buy new gear. But what will I do for this trip? She wept. Leave it to me, said Johnny. In the foyer, before they headed out for the Grand Place, he called a crisis meeting. Small problem, he said cheerfully. Now, I want 29 of you here to donate one item each to poor Sandra, whose case has gone missing. As Sandra looked on, stricken, she heard the offers coming through. Generous, well-meaning women offering her used T-shirts, a sweater, a pair of pants, sandals, a half size too big, nighties, jeans and shorts. And from the men, short sleeve shirts, a baseball cap, another sweater and an anorak four sizes too large. Ashen-faced, Sandra tried to thank them for their kindness as they all returned to their rooms and brought the terrifying collection, laying them proudly on Sandra's bed. She washed the dress that she was wearing, hoping it would be dry in the morning, and put on a disgusting-looking green and white shirt with a crushed pair of jeans and a hooded anorak. Glumly, she went out to the big square in the centre of Brussels and only half listened as Johnny told them all about the buildings, and led them to an inexpensive restaurant in a small street nearby. For tonight, Sandra had planned to wear a sleeveless cream-coloured shirt with a rose skirt. A cream and rose-coloured jacket would be on her shoulders for the photograph. Instead, she was pictured looking like a freak with 30 people in the group photograph. Next morning, as the coach thundered on to Paris, a quiet man said to her, that's my sweater you've got on. Looks much better on you than on me. Normally she would have told him that she didn't wear any synthetic materials and that unless something was pure wool, it was unwise to wear it at all. She might even have said that she didn't like that dull grey-blue colour and that she wanted something smarter that brought out the best in her complexion. But she said nothing and he said that the colour of his sweater was exactly the colour of her eyes. His name was Ken and he'd never taken a coach tour either. He worked too hard. And for his 30th birthday, 30 of his friends had bought him this trip as a gift. Sandra was wearing this terrible shapeless colourless garment in front of the Eiffel Tower. The day they went to Geneva, she wore the faded jeans of a woman called Lola, who'd taken a course at the Open University and discovered that actually she was very interested in the history of modern art. Now she worked in a local gallery and was considered a sort of expert. She'd married the gallery owner who was minding the shop while she darted around Europe on a coach having a quick look at everything she could see in 11 days. The day they got to Milan, Sandra was wearing a bright orange t-shirt, Lola's jeans, which were actually quite comfortable, and she had Ken's sweater tied around her shoulders. It's still the colour of your eyes, he said. And he asked Johnny the guide to take a picture of them arm in arm. I hope the t-shirt isn't the colour of my face, Sandra said, and everyone laughed. She was surprised. She hadn't really ever made a joke before. In Florence, Sandra got up early and went to the Uffizi Gallery with Lola. They stood, staggered by the beauty of the paintings. But I thought you only liked modern art, Sandra said to Lola. We can all like everything beautiful, Lola said. 
Isn't it wonderful that there's so much for us all to see? In Venice, Sandra wished that she and Ken could have taken a gondola together. They might have, but foolishly, she had said it would be a waste of money and she preferred to spend her lira on shoes. She would remember to keep her mouth closed about such things in future. That evening, in a crushed lilac skirt and a shrunken yellow jumper, as she strolled around the beautiful streets of Florence hand in hand with Ken, Sandra said how much she was enjoying it all. Such great people, such deep, satisfying things to see. I'd love to know all about these Renaissance painters, she admitted. Like what kind of lives they lived and were they special in themselves? It's all such a mystery. Maybe we could do a course when we get back to London. That is, if you, you feel like meeting me again, Ken said. And Sandra thought it would be a great idea. Sandra had intended to buy shoes in Rome, but what was the point if she was wearing these terrible clothes? Instead, she invited Ken to come out on an early evening tour, just the two of them, in a horse and carriage. She could have got really good shoes for the money, but she had plenty of shoes at home. That night, the group all went to supper in a beautiful piazza, all of them talking like old friends about the marvellous things seen and those still to come. Johnny wasn't with them. He'd had to stay in the hotel because he was expecting a message. He was such a good tour leader that they were all deciding already what they would buy him as a gift. Some were saying they should get him a briefcase, one of those lovely soft leather cases. Others said a really expensive Italian silk tie. Ken thought he might like one of those embroidered waistcoats. He'd heard him admiring them. They were fiendishly expensive, but between 30 of them, it would be easy to buy. Sandra was about to open her mouth and say that for someone like Johnny, to wear one of those elegant waistcoats would be ridiculous. But she kept it closed. She was becoming less and less sure of things on this trip. The waistcoat would make Johnny look enormous, but then, if Ken had said that he admired them... She handed over her contribution willingly and they all went silent because Johnny appeared with a message in his hand. I have wonderful news for you, Sandra. They've located your bag of all your smart clothes. It'll be there to greet you when you get home. He looked at her, waiting for the delight in her eyes. Instead, he saw gratitude and he heard polite remarks. This was the woman who'd bitten his head off nine days ago and said that our holiday was ruined. I'll be able to wash and iron all your kind gifts to me, she said to the group, and then I'll send them all back to you. They told her she must keep them. It would be their privilege. Sandra remembered the fun she'd had in these jeans and that T-shirt, how well and easily she slept in that nighty. She remembered the lilac skirt and the shrunken jumper she'd worn when Ken had said he would like to see her in London. I'd love to keep them all, and I'll never forget you, she said. They smiled at Sandra in a way that she knew they would somehow never have smiled if she had not lost her suitcase. The end. Hope you enjoyed that one, and I shall look forward to your company next Saturday. And any suggestions, if there are any authors you might like to, uh, to hear stories from, or um, perhaps, you know, a children's story we're talking about, maybe doing that, then uh, do send that over to me. But in the meantime, have a great bank holiday weekend. Look after yourself, stay safe, stay well, and stay in touch, and I'll see you soon.